Welcome to the annual Black History Month keynote at the University of Michigan Flint. Thank you all for your attendance and support of this program. My name is David Luke. I use he, him pronouns, and I serve as the Chief Diversity Officer and Director of the Intercultural Center at University of Michigan Flint. And I have the privilege of helping to plan this event in conjunction with the MLK Day Planning Committee. Typically, we like to host this keynote in the University of Michigan Flint Theater as an event that is free and open to the public. This year, we made the decision to have a virtual program due to both the weather and the continuing COVID-19 pandemic. Still, I remain enthusiastic and excited to hear our guest speaker's remarks and to engage with her in Q&A. I'd like to briefly explain the structure of the evening's program. In a few minutes, we'll turn things over to our keynote speaker who will give her lecture. Following that, we'll transition to a general Q&A until our program concludes at seven o'clock. For the Q&A, please use the Q&A feature as opposed to the chat function. I will be able to see the questions as they come in and we will try to get as many questions addressed as time will allow. Now I'd like to let the Intercultural Center Program Manager, Hugh Dockery, provide a land acknowledgement and turn things over to a faculty colleague to introduce our speaker. Q. Thank you. So once again, I'm Q. I use she, her pronouns. I am the program manager for the ICC. And so we would like to acknowledge that the land that the University of Michigan Flint occupies is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary homeland of many indigenous nations. Most recently, the Ashinaabek, including the Potawatomi, Chippewa, Ojibwa, Ottawa tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide, forced relocation, and removal from many from this territory. We honor and respect the many indigenous people, including those of the Three Fire Alliance who are still connected to this land. The University of Michigan Flint is committed to the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in that spirit, we are enthusiastic about this symposium and collaboration with our campus partners, knowing that there is so much to learn about the multiple and varied contributions of Islam to our world. We are very excited about our speaker today, but we wanted to invite a dear colleague to introduce her. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Daniel Burchock, Assistant Professor of Anthropology in the Department of Behavioral Sciences. Professor Burchock is an alumnus of the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and is an anthropologist of religion interested in religion and public life, especially Islam in Indonesia. Please welcome Professor Daniel Burchock. Thank you so much, Q, for that introduction. Um, and again, I'm Daniel Burchak, Assistant Professor of Anthropology, and I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, so I'll just begin by saying it's a true honor to introduce Dr. Suad Abdul Kabir this evening. Dr. Kabir is Associate Professor of American Culture and Arab and Muslim American Studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She's the author of numerous scholarly articles and a book uh, entitled Muslim Cool, Race, Religion, and Hip Hop in the United States. All of this work is rightfully much acclaimed, um, and it examines how American Muslim identities are formed and displayed through ideas, dress, and social activism, all at the intersection of race and state power. Now, for most human beings, this would be enough, a true life's work. But Dr. Kabir is no like normal human being. She's also a self-described scholar, artist, activist, who engages in multiple forms of public scholarship, has a one-woman hip-hop show that uh, explores issues of race, gender, art, and Muslims in the United States, and runs Sapello Square, um, an online blog and resource centering Black Muslim voices in the public square. Um, so for, you know, given this impressive list of projects and accomplishments, Dr. Kabir is one of those people whom introducing as an exercise in, in humility. Um, and um, it isn't simply the quantity and quantity of, of her work that's impressive, um, but the quality, um, the relevance, and the, the many broad and diverse audiences that she engages, it, it really is truly impressive, and, and we're really lucky to have her here this evening. Um, so I know I've been looking forward to this talk uh, ever since it was announced, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Kabir to, um, to begin her lecture, We Shook Up the World, Black Islam and Black History. Dr. Kabir? Um, good evening. Um, I begin in the name 
of Allah, for the love of Muhammad, in honor of the ancestors and the celebration of my people. I also begin by acknowledging as a descendant of stolen people on stolen land, that the land upon which we gather is the ancestral and unceded territory of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And some of us are uninvited guests, but we can work so that these land acknowledgements turn into tangible action so we no longer have to be. I also acknowledge, begin an acknowledgement by way of the histories of colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy and resistance that brought us to this very moment that every day is Ashura and every land is Karbala. I also begin today in deep gratitude to David Luke, Mai Li, the Intercultural Center and the entire University of Michigan Flint community for inviting me to deliver this keynote lecture. And I extend that gratitude to everyone in the listening audience, friends and enemies alike. <laughs> Like I heard Jay-Z once say, you could be anywhere in the world, but you are here with me. I appreciate that. Speaking of brothers with the gift of gab, the title of my lecture, We Shook Up the World, Black Islam is Black History, is inspired by this historic moment in 1964, where a 22-year-old boxing upstart challenged and beat Sonny Liston to become heavyweight champion of the world. Hold it, he's yelling behind us. Taj is like, wait a minute, come here. Come here, come here, come here, champ. I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. No, I don't have a mark on my face. Yes. And I upset Sonny Liston, and I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. Now, I told you? the world, I talk to God every day. If God's with me, can't nobody be against me, Sonny. I shook up the world. Uh, I know God, I know Cassius. the real God. Cassius, wait a minute, wait a minute, Cassius. Let me ask you this now. You told me when you visited in Los Angeles, you could do it in eight. Well, you thought Sonny and figured Sonny was great. How I come you did it in six or seven? I, you did it in seven. I had him going in eight. I was getting ready to take him in the eighth, as you can see. But the man stopped it just to keep from making me look so great. Right. I see. Now, give us that poetry on number seven. He wanted to go to heaven, so I took him in seven. You took him in seven. I am the king of the world. Hold it, hold it, hold I'm it. Pretty. Hold it, you're not that pretty. I'm a bad man. Wait, wait. I shook up the world. I shook up the world. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. I shook up the world. Wait a minute, Cash. Wait a minute. So at this point, Muhammad Ali is still publicly known as Cassius Clay, but he's already become a Muslim as a part of the Nation of Islam, like his good friend Malcolm X, who accompanied him that night in Miami. When I listened to this clip, I noticed some of Ali's turns of phrase. I'm a bad man. I'm pretty. I talk to God every day. If God's with me, can't nobody be against me. I know the real God. I shook up the world. Now, there's a lot of course, of this bombast and bravado, which is not exactly unwarranted since he did actually do what he came to do that day. But in some ways, it's just the dressing for this unwavering faith in oneself, one's power, one's human dignity, because the God who got you also made you just the way you are supposed to be. This is a perspective that is very Black and very, very Black Muslim. Although kind of playful, Ali's claims echo something much older than he, something that is historic and enduring, what is called the Black radical tradition. The Black radical tradition can be defined in many ways. I am personally a fan of how the scholar Cedric Robinson talks about it. The Black radical tradition begins with the point that the Africans who were bought, brought to these shores of the Americas were human beings. Why is that important? They were human beings, and so it means they had their own ideas and beliefs about the nature of things. And these beliefs and ideas were radical because they exceeded the limits of the European imagination. This means it exceeded what Europeans thought about Africans and even who Africans were and even who Europeans were. And that extends itself to ideas like, who is a human and what does it mean to be free? Indeed, what the Spanish, the British, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese didn't account for, to quote Robinson, is the historic, the quote, historic and social consciousness of Africans. They don't account for this because of the ideology of white supremacy that is coming to existence at the same time that Africans are being enslaved in the transatlantic slave trade. 
And white supremacist ideology makes it so that slavery and economic exploitation, particularly African slavery becomes common sense and inevitable. But the quote unquote inferiority of Africans was neither common sense nor inevitable. So when I hear Ali, I hear that mix of knowledge of God and knowledge of self that foments rebellion and the building of new worlds. Hold it, he's yelling behind us. And this, these, this, these two things, rebellion and building, is the hallmark of what Black Islam has meant to and contributed to Black history in the Americas. Now, if we were in person, I would ask an audience question, I would say, how many people have heard of the Black radical tradition to get a show of hands? Now, I don't know what your hands are looking at like right now, but I'm guessing that not too many people are really, really familiar with the Black radical, tra radical tradition. And there's a reason for that. You know, I think there is this undercurrent in our history, and when we talk about Black history, this question, why didn't we fight back? Like, how did you end up being enslaved for so long? Now, this is a problematic question, but I think it is a question that many people carry. And part of the reason people carry this question is because we don't really know the full story, right? And the full story of Black history is not just this idea of people who were once free sort of finally resigning themselves to enslavement. Rather, the full history of Black history is one of rebellion. And Black Muslims are key leaders and players in that story of rebellion. So what we're going to look at today is these instances, right? Black Islam is Black history. Black history is rebellion and building. Now, there are a number of places and periods where this story could be good, begin. It could begin in Africa. It could begin before Columbus, definitely. But for today, I'm going to begin with the transatlantic slave trade. And not because Black history before enslavement is irrelevant, but precisely because of that history before, precisely because of those origins, it opens up a space not to detail Black subjugation, but to detail Black rebellion. So when we look at the populations that were enslaved in the Americas, historians note that among those enslaved Africans were African Muslims. We know this because the regions from which they were taken, like Senegambia, which today comprises Senegal and the Gambia, which was home to Muslim intellectual and spiritual traditions for centuries. Now for the colonizers, Muslims were a problem. So in particular, let's take the Spanish. So the first African slave revolt in the Americas happened on Christmas in 1521 in the island of Hispaniola on the plantation of Christopher Columbus's son. Like it's really sort of really perfect how this happened. And it was led by Wolof is what they call them. Wolof is an ethnic group, right? That comes from Senegal. And Wolof would have been Senegalese, they would have been Muslim. And in this revolt, not only did the enslaved African Muslims on that plantation rise up to free themselves, but they went around to rally other enslaved Africans to join them and uprise as well. And this isn't the only revolt led by the Wolof. There were others in Puerto Rico and Panama. And so the Wolof become the only African population identified by name in Spanish royal decrees that prohibited or attempted to prohibit the importation of Wolof um, ethnic Africans to the new world because they were arrogant, disobedient, rebellious, incorrigible, right? They were defiant, they ran away, and really pointedly, they would seek alliances with the indigenous populations where they, where they, had, brought, where they, were, where they had been brought to. Now, every colonizer didn't prohibit the importation of enslaved Muslims, but perhaps they should have, particularly the French, because who many consider the father of the Haitian Revolution was a Muslim, an imam, a marabou called Francois Mackendel. Now, Mackendel, like many, like we're saying, many of the enslaved Africans of that period was from West Africa, potentially what is today Sierra Leone or the Senegambia region. He was a Mandingo ethnic group and came from a notable family 
and he had been trained in religious sciences, so from law to metaphysics before his captivity. He is captured as a prisoner of war and he is sold into slavery at the age of 12. He is brought to the island of Hispaniola, he ends up in Haiti, and he ultimately escapes and becomes a maroon. And maroon is the term, for those who don't know, that was used to describe, or it's the English version of the term, that was used to describe um, enslaved Africans who ran away from plantations and created communities, free communities, in sort of the hinterlands of a colony. So it might be the mountains or the swamps, like what happened in Virginia. So, and, you know, and they were a, they were a sore spot for slave owners, right? Because they were free. And not only were they free, they would raid plantations and they would try to foment, like to you know, get other people to join to sort of, um, to, up, to up end slavery altogether. Mackendall in particular lived for about 18 years, quote, making frequent incursions on plantations to deliver death. He had this knowledge of how to make poisons, which he would teach people. Um, and for about six years before he was killed, he grew a collective of followers. And people thought he was like a prophet, or he was said to be like a prophet, and he had these visions. And one of his visions was of a free and Black-led Haiti. He sought to realize this vision by, by plotting to poison the water where he was, but he got caught slipping and was betrayed, and then he was burned at the stake in 1758. But the reason why he's called the father of the Haitian Revolution, because that was only his, his vision was ultimately realized. 33, year, 30, 33 years later, another Haitian, another enslaved African, Bukman, um, who some say was a Vodou priest and others say was a Muslim, um, said a prayer that launched the Haitian Revolution. And I'm going to, and Bukman, you know, quickly, he was initially, he was from West Africa. He was initially enslaved in Jamaica and then brought to Haiti. And there's this famous um, scene, people talk about the Haitian Revolution at this place, Boy Kaiman, where a ceremony, um, a ceremony, a religious ceremony, uh, where, uh, where traditional African religions and people say Islamic traditions came together to um, spark the revolution. And I'm going to read his prayer. Um, that has come down to us from tradition. And so it says, the God who created the earth, who created the sun that gives us light, the God who holds up the ocean, who makes the thunder roar, our God who has ears to hear, you are hidden in the clouds who watch us from where you are. You see all that the white has made us suffer. The white man's God asks him to commit crimes, but the God within us wants us to do good. Our God who is so good, so just. He orders us to revenge our wrongs. It's he who will direct our arms and bring us to victory. It's he who will assist us. We all should throw away the image of the white men's God who is so pitiless. Listen to the voice for liberty that speaks in all of our hearts. And the reason why, in addition to just being a powerful prayer, and we can imagine what that means to sort of begin to sort of, you know, march towards your freedom in this kind of way, is this part that I've highlighted. It's he who will direct our arms. For those who say Bukman was Muslim, they say you know, his name is Bukman, which is a way of saying Bukman, which probably meant he had a Quran with him. Um, but also this, ver this part of his prayer, it's he who will direct our arms, immediately reminded me of a verse in the Quran and this surah that's called the spoils of war, you did not throw when you threw, but God threw. Now, the Haitian Revolution and its significance cannot be underestimated. At the time, Haiti was the most productive colony, and it had extreme rates of Black mortality because of that. So the enslaved Africans did not reproduce themselves through reproduction. Rather, the working conditions were so dangerous that they would die and they'd be replaced with new enslaved people. So this colony was coveted not just by the French who were its, its colonial masters at the time, but the Spanish and the British who were the mightiest art armies of that period. Haiti becomes the second independent colony in the West, the first being the United States, but it becomes the first slave society to permanently abolish slavery. And what's significant about that is that it then Haiti becomes the source and the space 
for this radical idea of liberty and freedom. Because the French at the time of the revolution, you know, they're having their own revolution, right? To kind of free themselves from land elites. But at the same time, on the other hand, they're enslaving people on all, all, the, all the parts of the world. And the same thing with the United States. And so it doesn't really make sense that if you're talking about liberty, liberty, equality, fraternity, right? Um, that you would then also be enslaving people. But it makes sense, right, if you're following this white supremacist ideology where some people are men and some people are others. In contrast, these Africans who came from societies that had slaves, right, they came to the conclusion that real freedom meant that all humans, right, should be free and should be, it should be free, right, to sort of live out their destiny, which is a goal that, you know, we still have yet to achieve. The Haitian Revolution had a significant impact, not just in these ideas of freedom and revolution, but also for enslaved Africans elsewhere, right? So we know sort of in 1795, right, there is a group of enslaved Africans in Louisiana who revolt shortly after, which is followed by the German Coast Uprising in 1811, which is the largest slave insurrection in US history. I think it's about 500 enslaved people were part of that insurrection. Gabriel, Gabriel Prosser's revolt in Richmond in 1800, Denmark Bessie and Charleston in 1822, right, are said to have been inspired by or in actual contact with Haitian um, leaders. And then another um, uprising in a different part of the world. You know, oftentimes, in the US context, we think about enslavement and, and slavery and slave as if it only happened in the US, right? But you know, the numbers tell us that only about 5% of enslaved Africans were actually enslaved in the United States, with 40% of them being in Brazil, like in the country of Brazil. And in 1835, in Brazil, in Bahia, there was the Malay Revolt. This was a revolt inspired again by the Haitian Revolution. It was a multi-ethnic um, group of um, enslaved, Afri enslaved and free Africans, but led by the Muslims, by the Hausa, you know, they, who brought their religious tradition into right, their fight for freedom. So they were white, which has spiritual significance. They identified their uprising as a jihad, as a spiritual struggle against oppression. They chose to, um, uh, they chose to launch the uprising in Ramadan. And while this um, revolt wasn't successful in the sense that it didn't lead to the immediate abolition of slavery. In fact, slavery lasted in Brazil. I think Brazil was maybe the last place in the Western Hemisphere to have um, abolition. It did lead, it did increase the fear for white slave owners across the hemisphere, right? And this in the sphere of Muslims. So what does that mean in terms of my topic, right? Black Islam is Black history. Well, part of this is about the, the Muslims who are part of these uprisings, the Muslims who are leading these uprisings were doing so from their identities as Muslims, right? Their identities that we were born free. And the only, the only sort of master we have is God. And so when, you, when you're coming from, even though they came from societies with slaves, when you're coming with that idea, then when they come into, um, when they come into contact, when they come into, the, into this new world, they're immediately, you know, looking for ways to resist. And they're using their traditions as a form of resistance. Now, the black radical tradition that I've discussed so far, you know, we're talking about rebellions that are armed. But that is not the only type of resistance that Africans and African Muslims engaged in. So there was escape, of course, like with Maroons. Um, there was arson, there was suicide, um, there was just malignancy. You know, these, if you read the records, you hear, the, you hear um, slave owners complaining about people who are dumb or slow, right? And we know that these are tactics that people are using as a form of resistance and rebellion to their um, captivity. And then there was also what we would call a spiritual rebellion. So I want to show a clip from the 1991 film, Daughters of the Dust. Um, I saw this film as a young person, um, and I have two distinct memories. The first is of a scene where girls are doing hand clapping games. And my mother kind of leaning over to me and whispering, you know, 
those are traditions that we brought with us from Africa. And the other being the Muslim character in the film, but particularly this opening where the film opens with the call to prayer. So let me play that for you. If it will play. So the film, one of its opening scenes is this scene. Um, this is, a, it starts in 1902. It's in the Gullah Islands um, off the coast of Georgia. And it begins with this scene of this man, of this African, at this point, an emancipated African, reciting the call to prayer, the Muslim call to prayer. And as it pans, right, it takes us to see these hands in a, a sort of a supplication um, position, and then a book, potentially a Quran, with Arabic script, right, whose pages are sort of, you know, wafting in the air. Um, and I remember just like my mother leaned over and she was like, you know, the hand clapping is something that we brought with us from Africa. She also said, you know, Islam is something that we brought from us to Africa. And this stood out to me as part of this forms of spiritual right? So, and I know that this scene was inspired by the story of the African Muslim communities in the Gullah Islands, like Sapelo Island, and also the stories of others like Yaro Mahmoud and Omar ibn Said. Um, Yaro Mahmoud was enslaved at the age of 16, and he labored um, as an enslaved person in the Maryland, sort of DC area. And he was able to purchase his own freedom at the age of 60. And later he was able to sort of purchase property and become sort of a financier. But what's most compelling to me about his story um, was that he was a practicing Muslim this whole time. And on the screen, you'll see this print, right? It's a print, it shows, it's, 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 so on one, one image you see is this painting, a famous painting of him done um, during the period. And then this is the work of a contemporary black Muslim artist, Sophia Cheatham, where she made this print. And this print is of him walking to the bank, right? And in Arabic, it says, Alhamdulillah, all praises to God. Because Yaro Ma'bout in the, in the, in the um, historical records and the narratives about him, they say he would walk through the streets of DC, you know, singing the praises of God. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And when talking about what inspired her to make this work, Cheatham said something that I found pretty compelling, right? So singing the praises of God, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, is what we call dhikr in um, Muslim tradition, right? Which is an Arabic word for remembrance, right? And she was saying, you know, with this practice of remembrance is both these enslaved, formerly enslaved free Africans remembering God, but also remembering themselves, right? Who they really are, where they really come from in a context where everything around them is seeking to strip that. Likewise is the story of Omar Ibn Said. He also was born in West Africa. Um, he was enslaved as an adult and labored for about 37 years. Now in his case, he is said to actually have converted to Christianity. Yet when he writes his autobiography in 1831, which is the only sort of full Arabic um, manuscript, he wrote in Arabic, um, of, an, of an enslaved African that we have, he opens it with, in the name of God, most merciful, most gracious, the Basmallah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and with a praise on Prophet Muhammad. And the very last writing, that we have of his is him writing a chapter of the Quran called Victory, which reads, when the help of God and victory come and you see the people enter God's religion in crowds, 
glorify the praises of your Lord and ask his forgiveness. Verily, he is the one who accepts repentance and forgives. Remembering God, remembering yourself, knowledge of God, knowledge of self as forms of rebellion. Black Islam is black history and black history is rebellion. Now, up until this point, I think, yeah, just about everyone I've talked about has been male. And that is kind of the consequence of not what actually happened in the past, but the ways in which the past has been recorded and recovered. But women are not absent, right, from this Black Islamist history and Black history is rebellion narrative, right? We know that enslaved African Muslim women would nurture their communities in many ways, and particularly by upholding practices like the practice of charity. So um, the scholar, Sylvia Andouf, talks about this in her book, Servants of Allah. And she describes how, you know, Afri enslaved African Muslim women who lived again on the sea islands off the coast of Georgia would give sadaqa charity in the form of this rice cake that was, that they called sadaqa. And, you know, sadaqa, sadaqa, right? This relationship between this world. And this is a practice that comes from West Africa. So these women who were enslaved and worked in sort of rice paddies, they would copiously collect rice, taking from their own rations, taking what they might be able to siphon off without being noticed, um, what they might be able to purchase if they did have a little bit of money. And descendants of these women described how they made the cakes and how they shared the cakes. She washed rice and poured off all the water. She let rice sit all night and in morning rice all swell. She take that rice and put it in a wooden mortar and beat it to a paste with wooden pestle. She add honey, sometimes sugar, and make it in a flat cake with her hands. The cake made, she call us all and, and there she grab a big handful and she give us each cake. Then we all stand around the table and she say, Amin, Amin, Amin. And we all eat cake. And Amin is the Arabic, right? Which you may have heard um, a similar English, Amen, right? So it's a way of, of closing an activity, a way of being thankful to God, right? Um, and, and bring sanctity to what you're doing. And so if we think about Macandell and the Haitian Revolution to, you know, Margaret Muhammad of Sapelo Island, right, making these rice cakes, what we see is that Black Islam as Black history means rebellion, resistance by any means necessary, whether that's armed with bodily force or armed with spirituality. All these are means to get free, you know, just like God made you to be. Now, let's fast forward um, about 50 years after emancipation, at least in the U.S., and we find that this nexus of Black Islam and the Black radical tradition, um, this tradition of rebellion is still going strong, but in new places no longer on plantations or in mountain escapes, but, but it's building new worlds and in newly industrialized cities like Detroit, Chicago, New York, and Flint, Michigan, um, where black migrants from the Southern United States, black migrants from the English and Spanish, um, English and Spanish speaking Caribbean and Latin America encountered Muslim migrants from countries such as Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, and Pakistan, and India. We see this in the story of Mufti Sadiq, a Muslim missionary from British India who preached a message of racial equality to Black Americans, finding his position as a colonial subject of the British Empire matched their um, position as colonial subjects of US Empire. There was an emphasis and he was um, a missionary of the Ahmadi Muslim tradition. And there was this emphasis on racial equality that was also matched with one on gender equity. And this idea, what Sylvia Chan Malik talks about, this idea of Islam as a safe harbor for Black Muslim women. And you see on the slide this picture from Chicago in the 20s of these Black Muslim women converts to Islam. We see that this building of new worlds, right? We see it in the story of Sheikh Daoud and Mother Khadija Faisal of the Islamic Mission um, of America established in Brooklyn, New York. 
unlike Sadiq, um, Sheikh Dawood and Mother Khadija were converts to Islam. They were Muslims, they were black people of Caribbean descent, and they practiced Sunni Islam. They sort of built a kind of multi-ethnic black congregation. So you have black people from all parts of the world, even the continent who were part of this congregation. You know, they actively participated in the, the um, movement work of the time. There's actually a famous picture of Sheikh Dawood, Malcolm X. And they were very much pan-African and transnational. And again, gender was important. You know, my mother, um, Amina Masalhaq, when she became Muslim in the 70s, she became, they started in the 30s, right? So she became Muslim in the 70s and she would attend the, what they call the State Street Mosque. And she talked about how Mother Khadija would make sure that women had their place, right? That, 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 that the places where they had to pray, the access, everything they needed, she made sure that that was something that was not being compromised on. And I think what's interesting to me about, you know, Mufti Sadiq and the Ahmadi Muslim women, Mother Khadija Sheikh Dawa Faisal, and this idea of building, you know, here it's like we're building people, right? And we're building new worlds and new communities. We're echoing the rebellions of the past, but in a new way, this way, and sort of rebuilding. How an Islam becomes for people the way you uphold your human dignity and the way you reconnect to your African ancestry. And of course, we also see this building and perhaps the most famous um, of the sort of Black Muslim movements in the story of Elijah Muhammad, Clara Muhammad, and the Nation of Islam. And it occurs to me now <laughs> that this is a good time to explain maybe what I mean by Black, black Islam. And Black Islam is kind of this big term I use to describe the broad range of Muslim beliefs and practices that we find amongst US Black Americans. So like I mentioned, the Ahmadi Muslim, Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the Nation of Islam, Sunni Muslims, but also the Morris Science Temple, um, the 5% Nation of Gods and Earth, and also Shia and Sufi sort of traditions. Now, these groups have their differences, but I bring them together because when it comes to the Black experience and Black history, they all share this really pointed concern with the realities that Black people face, right? These realities of systemic inequality. And they respond to those conditions of injustice by articulating an alternative, alternative cosmologies, politics, social norms that are geared toward empowering the individual and their community. And I bring them together under this banner of Black Islam because within Black communities in the U.S., people who aren't even Muslim, right, they speak the same language of Black consciousness. Right. And so Black Islam then is a part of Black history, is a part of Black life and extraordinary moments, right, like the Haitian Revolution and embodied by larger than life figures like Malcolm X. But it's also part of the everyday practices, right, of Black life from language to food. So this is why, for example, you know, Beyonce is, you know, when she had that video and she's um, sampling Malcolm X talking to Black women, or why like every other Black person has a cousin named Raheem, right? Or like once I was watching that show Blackish and it was an episode about um, a cousin who had been incarcerated and they were coming out and the episode was about how they were going to handle that. But in the final scene, they're going to meet the cousin at a diner and they're like, oh wait, does he eat pork, right? <laughs> because of the ways in which Black Islam and Black Muslim, like these social customs and norms, right, are sort of a regular part of Black life. Now, um, when I was preparing for today, um, I thought, you know, I'm talking to folks who are in Flint, I should think about what Black Islam is Black history means to Flint. So I reached out to a friend of mine, she's a Flint native um, and um, a great researcher, Maysan Haydar, and she put me onto the fact that by giving this lecture, I'd be kind of walking into some of that Black Islam as Black history myself, because in October of 1963, one of my heroes, Al Haj Malik Al Shabazz Malcolm X, gave a lecture, a lecture at the University of Michigan Flint. I believe at the time it was called um, Flint College. At the time, he gave this lecture. There was a Nation of Islam temple in Flint. I think it was on. When I looked it up, all the art, one of the articles I saw said it was on 1601 Clifford Street. And Malcolm had come to Flint as part of the advance team because there was a rally um, that was being held, going to be held that weekend where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was going to present. 
And he was invited um, by a student group. It was like a world affairs student group. And so um, there was an interview with one of those students. His name was William Shedd. And he said, this is what he said about, this is part of what he said about the visit at, on the campus. He came, he spoke for about an hour. He told us of all the ills. At the conclusion of Malcolm's speech, he told us how historically we had done a lot of wrong things. You couldn't fault anything that he said. It was all totally accurate and honest. Even seen through anybody's eyes in the audience that day, they had to acknowledge this was history. And so the whole room got up and applauded. And that took his breath away. I don't think he had been in that kind of circumstance where the essentially white audience had said, you're right. Now, somewhat um, ironically, I don't know if that's the right word, but Malcolm was able to give his speech for about an hour at the university, but Elijah Muhammad's speech was interrupted about 20 minutes into it because two plain clothes officers attempted to, ent attempted to enter the rally with their weapons. Now, if you've ever been to a Nation of Islam event, you know that on fly, right? People come in, you get searched, right? Um, because the point of the event is to not have violence. When they explain this to the officers and shout out to the Flint archivist, Colleen, I'm forgetting Colleen's last name, who sent me this article. According to the article, you know, they explain this to them, the police refuse and continue to try to insist. And so rather than allow the police to come into the space armed, the rally was canceled. So there are about 2,500 people in this arena, right? They've been listening for 20 minutes and now it's over. And, you know, reading about this, you know, made me think about the current conversations we're having right now about the police and their role in Black communities. And thinking about the police and their, and their role in Black communities made me also then think about prisons. You know, I began this conversation or this talk talking about rebellions on plantations and then moved to this idea of building new worlds and cities but I would be you know, remiss if I didn't think about or talk about or invite us to think about this one place that is really significant to Black Islam, Black history and continues to be a site of oppression. And that is the prison. Now, you know, people call the prisons in the United States modern plantations and people call them that, you know, because prison is the only place in the country where slavery is still legal, right? The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery everywhere except for in the case of incarcerated people. And prison has been a significant space for Black Muslim communities. You know, for example, famously, you know, Malcolm X kind of learns about and encounters Islam in prison. So there's a narrative, which is very true in people's lives, where people discover knowledge of self and community in prisons. Um, there's been a lot of work. Um, last semester, I taught this book by scholar Garrett Felber, those who know don't say, that talks about Black Muslims in particular, the nation and the work they did in pioneering around prison advocacy. You know, basically ensuring that prisoners' rights are respected, particularly religious rights, you know, in a place where your rights are denied. And the flip side of that, or what comes with that, this advocacy was the punishment, right? So the ways in which punishments like solitary confinement um, were used, right, to sort of squash this kind of advocacy. And, this relationship between Black Assam and prisons also sort of has a resonance in Flint. So I actually was able to speak with a sister named Mariam Rasul, who runs a youth center in, in, in Flint. And she told me the story of her mother, um, Shahida Rasul. Um, Shahida joined the Nation of Islam, the Nation of Islam in Boston in the 60s. And then she and her husband, Arif, moved to Flint where they raised their family. And she said her mother started this thing called a 1-800 dowel line. And so basically what it was, and for those who are like, I guess, born in the 2000s, you might not just remember this 1-800. <laughs> you know, 1-800 was this thing where you could like call, you could make a number and call. And so she created this dowel line for women in distress, right? Women who were in distress would call for support or just for a listening ear. And at one point, a woman called Sister Shahida from the prison in the area um, and she was in prison because she had been accused of murdering her husband in self-defense. And she was Muslim, but she, none of the things she needed to live as a Muslim being, she, she was 
being given access to, the things that, that by law she should be. And so Sister Shahida began to go to the prisons weekly and she would, you know, host religious studies classes. She would put money on people's commissaries, right? And when women were released, she would help them upon release as well. And she worked, right, with, in the prisons with um, in, in women in captivity when they became, when they came out until the prison closed. And, you know, what's really, um, powerful about Sister Shahida's story in this relationship to prisons is, right, this story of advocacy, right, this idea that people are incarcerated, and just because they're incarcerated doesn't mean they're not human beings, doesn't mean they don't have needs, and doesn't mean they can be, you know, sort of lock, you know, so, you know, they lock the door, throw away the key. But in addition to that story, right, in terms of Black Islamist, Black history around prison advocacy and advocating for the rights of prisoners, under this kind of theme of building is also this question of abolition. So we think a lot about now about police, we think about prisons and we think about abolition and the role of black Islam, primarily through black Muslim women and helping us, pushing us towards abolition. So I wanna play this clip. Let's see. Okay, here we go. I said they could take us out of the communities and organizers, away from our organizing efforts around all those other, other oppressive conditions that affect us, and put us into the jails and the courts to organ that dealing with um, trials and everything else, and so we don't have the resources, people power, to be the organizers and raise and have it with police brutality issues. We don't have the time to deal with the fact that the prisons are rising over and over again and all our people being thrown behind the bars in prisons. That they you and where shadow slavery does not exist in the streets. That it exists behind the walls of these prisons. And they are you being used as economic slave labor inside the walls. We don't have time for that because we're dealing with the issue of our brothers and sisters going back and forth to jails. And we're dealing with making sure that families are taken care of. And we're dealing with making sure that their treatment is being handled. But if we build a prison an organization like Jericho to deal with the issues of making sure that the political prisons of these organizations are taken care of, then our other organizations, we can go back in the community and do our work of freeing our communities, freeing our people in an oppression and oppressive conditions that affect us as a people. But they did their job well. They did it so well that some of us are afraid to go back and organize anymore because we're wondering who's going to deal with us if we get cut and, and if we're picked up off the street as political prisoners. And if, we, if we're wondering that, then we're not out there doing what we should be doing. We're worried about the fact because our practice has shown we won't deal with the issue of freedom for our political prisoners. So we have to build. Jericho is designed to take that responsibility off individual organizations and give it to one group of people under one umbrella to deal with the issue of amnesty and freedom for our political prisoners and deal with the issue of uh, adequate medical care for our political prisoners and deal with the issue of making sure they get visits and commissary and adequate legal defenses and everything else. And we have to do that if we intend to be about, in, about the job of creating revolution in America. And we have to have strategies and tactics designed to make sure that this is viable. So um, I'm not sure, I wasn't able to get this caption before um, the talk today. I know we have the transcript, but I can just sum up a little bit. So this is Sophia Bukhari. Um, Sophia Bukhari um, was born in Harlem um, and she was, became a member of the Black Panther Party in 1969. She was also a member of the Black Liberation Army, um, the Republic of New Africa, and she was in prison for nine years on a charge of robbery and murder. Um, she was released in 99 and went on to co-found the New York chapter of the Free Mumi Abu Jamal Coalition and other organizers like the Jericho, organizations rather, like the Jericho Movement that she's talking about here, which is the Jericho Movement, which is an organization which is dedicated to advocating for the release of political prisoners in the United States. In um, her comments, right, she's sort of identifying the prison, both one, that we have political prisoners in the United States, right? This is something that, you know, our sort of national discourse tends to 
pretend doesn't happen here, that there are not people who are incarcerated and have been incarcerated for now we have people, they're all these elders, right? For their political beliefs. That's one. The other is that, and then, and how the prisons, right? Like the chattel slavery, she says chattel slavery does not exist in the streets. It exists in the walls of these prisons, right? So how people in captivity, right, are in forms of slavery and also how that captivity and what's happening to them is sort of undermining and weakening our community life in so many different ways. So sort of this kind of the long durée of white supremacy, the long durée of this black, the black struggle for freedom continues to be impacted, right? by this question of captivity, by the ways in which Black life, right, and Black freedom is sort of in the balance. And so Sophia Bukhari, so she talks about this in that clip. Um, she actually passed away um, in 2003, so this is sort of old, an older clip. Sophia Bukhari becomes a Muslim um, in 1971. And she becomes a Muslim in the Greenhaven Correctional Facility. And this is funny when I was reading about this because my mother also became Muslim in Greenhaven Correctional Facility and neither Sophia Bukhari nor my mother were incarcerated people at that time, right? Because the Greenhaven Correctional Facility had a mosque, right? It was a San Corey mosque. And it was a place where people who were, had radical politics and had found Islam as a place where they could express those radical politics and found themselves incarcerated where they kind of ended up. And in this book, The War Before, um, that kind of collects some of Sophia Bukhari's um, writings, she, when she talks about becoming Muslim, right, and how, and how Islam shapes her, she quotes this thing. She's like, I remember the admonishments of Allah. It is incumbent upon Muslims to wage struggle against tyranny and oppression wherever it may be found and fight in the way of a law until tyranny and oppression is no more. And so similar to the enslaved African Muslims of the 16th century, right? We have free and captive, right? Muslims of African descent in the 20th century, in the 21st century, right? Who are also, right, participating in this tradition of the black radical tradition and these traditions of rebellion and building. And because one of the things that Sophia Bukhari says in this tape is that we have to build strategies and tactics to basically free ourselves continuously in that process. So I'm going to conclude um, on this point. My talk was entitled, We Shook Up the World, Black Islam is Black History. And I started talking about the Haitian Revolution. And I feel like some people might be like, why is a Black history keynote about Black Islam talking about the Haitian Revolution, right? So I'm starting in the plantations of the Haitian Revolution to the prisons of 21st century United States. And part of the reason why I did that is because I think the story of Black Islam is Black history is a story of the African diaspora, right? You know, we've been having a lot of conversations in the last couple of years about the date 1619, right? which is important in terms of sort of the history of enslavement I mean, and the exploitation that comes with it in what is now called the United States. But it's not, it doesn't occur in a vacuum, right? 1521 is about almost hundred years before that and we have, right, enslaved Africans and they're revolting, right? So this idea that we need to think about, to think about Black Islam as Black history is significant not just because of the ways in which Black Muslims play, play roles, right, in rebelling and, and rebellion and building new worlds, but also in the ways that it forces us to think about who Black people are and what are our connections to each other. You know, this idea of Blackness as a transnational identity. You know, I've been focusing on kind of Black Muslim leadership, Black Muslim activity around rebellion and building in this hemisphere. But there's also stories, right, that connect to what Black Islam is and what Black history looks like, right, that are across the Atlantic in other places. And so part of my objective here, hopefully there's some success, is to say that Black Islam is Black history, right, is a story of rebellion. Black history is a story of rebellion. And not just rebellion, but a story of building. What is our imagination? What do we actually really want, right? And 
be, in order to be able to build something new, you have to have what we talked about, that mix of knowledge of God, God and knowledge of self, right? Knowing that the God who got you made you just the way you're supposed to be, right? And that Black history is not just a U.S. story. It's not just a North American story, right? It's not even just a Western Hemisphere story. It's really a global story. And so I think talking about Black Islam then creates a space for us to think about those things. And lastly, because Black Muslims and Black Islam is committed to this idea of freedom for, um, for people, freedom, right, for all people, then it's also a story of, and how do I, how do I want to say this? It's a story of always paying attention to where injustice is, or actually, let me quote Sophia Bukhari to end, right? It is the story of waging a struggle against tyranny and oppression wherever it may be found. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we will take questions. You can use the Q&A feature and we do have one already, but um, you know, as you're thinking about the talk and the presentation and you're formulating your questions, please just throw them in the Q&A and I will um, ask our speaker. So the first question comes from um, Maksud Aftab who says, great talk. Can you comment on the kingdom of Mali and pre-Columbia attempts at early African America interactions? I suppose I can. I can't say that that's, <laughs> that's what I'm prepared to do, but I can't. I mean, what we do know is that, um, you know, we talk about the kingdom of Mali and um, specifically, I think people right now, maybe in the popular imagination, people talk about Mansa Musa, right, as being the richest man in, in human history. And so there are accounts that his brother um, took a fleet of ships from the coast of West Africa that landed in the Americas. And um, a good place to actually get a good narrative of this. There's a scholar called Sheikh um, Abdullah Hakim Quick, and he has a book called Deeper Roots. And he talks more specifically about this, but there are some evidences people find in the archeological record where they say they can see, right, this kind of contact between sort of West Africans and indigenous peoples of the Americas based on that voyage. Thank you. So we have another question. Um, this one is from Mohamed Dasa, who's a faculty member here at U of M Flint. He says, while most African-Americans in the U.S. are Christian, African-American Muslims have been a part of the fabric of the U.S. from the beginning. What can African-American Muslims do to play a more effective role in the many aspects, political, social, media, et cetera, where the non-Muslim African-Americans are active to be included and to have a voice? So, yes. Um, so... This reminds me of something I wanted to say that maybe I didn't say in the talk, you know, I'm focusing because the nature of my talk is Black Islam is Black, um, is Black history, precisely because, you know, there is, yes, the majority of Black people in the United States would identify as Christian, um, but we aren't all Christians, right? So there are people who are Muslim, there are people who practice, you know, Ifa, there are people who or Jewish, like there's a, there's, a, there's a real range of um, religious diversity in Black communities. And that's often sort of missing, or people don't talk about that, right, which has particular kinds of consequences. And I think part of that is that there are particular types of histories, right, that challenge status quo that get miss it, that, that kind of can be sort of paved over or missed, right? Um, in terms of the visibility of Black Muslims, you know, I don't think that I guess I don't, I don't think that Black Muslim invisibility or lack of visibility because Black Muslims aren't doing enough, right? It's like, to, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, someone like a Sophia Bukhari or like Jihad Abdul-Mabi who runs the Jericho Movement, who leads the Jericho Movement now, or like Miriam Kaba, who is huge, right? She's a huge figure in the abolition. I mean, these are Black people and they're Muslim and they're in it, <laughs> you know, they're not whatever, right? Like, I don't think it's because Black Muslims need to do more to be visible. I think rather what's happening is that because of this kind of presumption 
of a sort of a particular, and even a particular kind of Christian, <laughs> like, you know, sort of identity, like they, they're, they're sort of invisible. And I think that that um, is not unintentional. I think that that serves a very partic a particular political um, um, purpose. And so I guess, um, yeah, I think I'll stop with that. Thank you. As more questions are coming in, you, you did get a, just an expression of gratitude. So Kelly Parrott said, I wanna thank you for this amazing lecture and giving me a white mother of a young black man and with Islamic relatives, the uh, opportunity to listen, lean in and learn and just expressing gratefulness. I think one of the things, and I'll try to formulate a question was I have a bunch of things that I just scribbled on the back of an envelope while you were talking. Um, so I'm struck by a, a couple of things that I think stood out that you, the diversity of black people, the diversity of Muslims and the diversity within black Islam as you sort of described it. Um, but, I, and I was also thinking about the sort of liberative theology, right? That you're born free and how that informs thing. I, I guess I see then parallels to um, black Christian liberation mm -hmm. theology as well. And I was wondering if you wanna to speak to some of that at all, some of those intersections. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, Well, you know, my topic wasn't sort of Black Christ Christianity, but, you know, so for example, people who, like in the 20th century, people who become Muslim, oftentimes they're becoming Muslim because they're sort of rejecting Christianity because they see it as like the white man's religion, right? But that's not the only story of Christianity, right? Definitely, you know, sort of white Christians have used Christianity as a way to try to subjugate Black people. But on the same level, Black Christians, right, you know, have seen within their tradition all forms of liberation. I mean, we call, you know, Harry Tubman Moses, right? You know what I mean? The story of Moses, the children of Israel, Exodus, right? These biblical stories that we also find in Quranic traditions are really um, sort of foundational and fundamental to, right, to how sort of enslaved Black people would see themselves and then imagine themselves otherwise, right? And so I think there's definitely, right, these clear intersections between, um, right, this idea that you can have a system of belief about who God is, about what God wants, about how you were created, right, that comes out of Christianity, that comes out of Judaism, that comes out of Islam, that comes out of like Santeria, Condomblea, Ifa, right? These things all exist. I think the challenge is that sometimes the conversations, or at least in the public, sometimes we don't see those conversations happening in those ways. And then in some places there is hostility. I mean, like I'm from New York. And so in New York, like black people, all kinds of ways. So like people don't really trip, but I've had friends who are like from the South and they're like, nah, folks with straight, like not trying to hear it, right? So, so there is a difference there, but in terms of kind of the history and the practice, you know, there are more connections than sort of divisions. Thank you. Other questions? We have, please keep them coming. If you have questions, put them in the Q and A. Otherwise, I'm going to sit down. One second, hold on. Please. I'm standing because that was easier for me to talk to me. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> I'm going to sit. So, and we did get a question, and it, it's a little long. So I see you're you're ready. Um, yeah. Professor Dasa has another question. He says, you know, many claimed the first African-American president, Barack Obama, was a foreign-born Muslim, a secret Muslim. Um, while Obama is an American Christian, the accusations made it clear that some Americans considered Black Muslims to be dangerous or untrustworthy. What does this tell us about the way public opinion thinks of African-American Muslims and about Muslims in this country in general and how this view can be changed? That's a great question. So yeah, I mean, you know, the thing about Obama, or let me start another way. Um, the thing about Muslims, let me start there, maybe. So, you know, you know, based on the sort of talk that I gave tonight, like, you know, one of the things we know is that, you know, the first Muslims in this hemisphere, and particularly in the United States, would have been African, right, from different parts of Africa, and they would have been enslaved. Yet, if you were like, I don't know, go outside, throw a stone, hit somebody, and be like, 
who's a Muslim, right? They would think it's like someone who is not, hasn't been, you know, new to this country. Maybe they're from vaguely someplace in the Middle East or something like that, kind of tan, you know, this kind of thing. Like that's, that's the, um, that's the image. And again, like I was saying, you know, that is not um, by accident, right? And I think that's not by accident because, you know, when it comes to um, Black people in general in the United States, um, Black people, um, our very existence can cause for a real critical, a real critique, right, of what the country is, what it has been and where it should be going. But in the kind of discourse that we live with now, multiculturalism, Black struggle for freedom has become a sign of American success. Like, you know, like even, so at the same time people are like, Barack Obama is, you know, um, not a real, uh, not a real Christian. There are other people who are like, oh my God, look, we have a black president. People used to be slaves, now they're presidents, right? So everything's okay. Remember, I know people remember like when he was, when he was like, the, everyone was talking about we're post race now, right? Because we have this black president. The thing about black Muslims is if the Muslim is foreign and immigrant, there they can be a threat or they also can be this like, oh, look, anybody can make it here, right? The black person can be a threat or they can be, look, look at this progress. But when somebody sort of um, inhabits both of those categories, I feel like it's like, it does not compute. Like in terms of the ways in which we're meant to think about things, it's just like, uh, people, uh, the synapses, they fall, fire, miss, shoot, people are just like freaking out, right? You know what I mean? And I think that's important because, you know, and we think about like something with like an organization like the Nation of Islam, you know, when in 1959 it was, um, Mike Wallace did this um, series called The Hate the Hate Produced, right? And it was basically this expose on the Nation of Islam that was trying to show how they were like this black hating organization, right? Because of, um, you know, the thing, because of what they were trying to do in terms of empower black people. You fast forward, you know, X years later, we have the same kind of conversations. So I think that black Muslims, right, end up causing really troubling the presumptions we're supposed to accept about who black people are, who Muslims are. And so that is, I think, part of to the question and the question's gone now. So I don't know if I answered it all, but let me see. Um, I think I can find it. Um, so in terms of what the public opinion thinks of black Muslims, I think they don't think of them, right? Like, you know, I, I've always talked about this. Um, uh, there was, uh, after Trump was election, elected, um, there was a, um, Dave Chappelle hosted Saturday Night Live and the musical guests were a tribe called Quest and none of the reporting on that moment were like five black Muslim men were on Saturday Night Live last night, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> didn't even happen, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think they don't, the public doesn't have much of an opinion. If they have an opinion, they might think about Minister Farrakhan and they might be like, oh, this, maybe they're anti-Semitic, you know, this type of thing might happen. But generally speaking, I think the public doesn't have an opinion. That said, and I'll end on this point, or maybe there was a question about change, but the public doesn't have an opinion, but the state definitely does. And so Black Muslims are targeted by state violence, whether it's the war on drugs or the war on terror. That's true for Black, and particularly in the cases, for example, of um, Black Muslims of Somali descent, right? So there's, there's so, you know, so the, you know, Joe Blow down the street might not think about you, right? But those, you know, their police officers, intelligence officers who are thinking about you, right, and who are targeting you. So I think that's also important to understand. And how can that be changed? I mean, I think that being changed is just, is going to come as a part of just the general change that will occur in this country, you know, as more and more people are committed to fundamentally changing how things operate around here. So I don't really think this is about changing that perception per se. Like, I think it's more like there are more fundamental things that need to change. And that will just kind of come out of that, if that makes sense. Thank you.
So don't be shy in the questions, keep them coming. I'm gonna read a comment that came in the chat and then I'm, I know Professor Burchak has um, a question and he'll just unmute and say it, but let me read this um, comment first from Ray and Jandi. Not a question, but I wanted to say that I'm sad that we were not able to have this talk in person. Side note, I am also. Um, I have learned a great deal and you're truly an amazing speaker and I hope that we'll be able to see you in person in the near future. Oh, so. well, thank you. Because <laughs> it's hard to speak on Zoom. So I appreciate if it got through, like, that's great. So yeah. thank, you. thank you. Professor Burchak, we're ready for you. Come on, so, yeah, I'll, I'll third the, you know, it'd be great to meet in person and, and hopefully soon we can do that. Um, thanks for a great talk. And, um, you know, I really appreciate it, especially the historical depth and then how you layered themes through history. Um, so that was great. This is, um, I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of like observations that I hope leads to like more. And if not, that's fine too. Um, but I really latched on and I forget his name. Um, but the the former slave who's walking around DC resetting Zakir, like I really latched onto that. I thought that was a really powerful moment. And um, in, in particular, because I mean, the way you described it, right? So, so Zakir is the remembrance of God, right? But you also described it as a remembering of self. Um, and thinking about like how fundamental Zakir and the remembrance of God is in a lot of traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in many respects, like, I mean, that's where it's at, right? Like, like, like you want to remember God at all times in one, one's heart, ultimately, in many traditions. It was just a really powerful moment. And everything you said after that, I kept on coming back to that. Um, you know, and it really, I thought, encapsulated this theme of, of, of um, this as rebellion in the sense of knowledge, and, and then the knowledge of God, knowledge of self. So I, I guess I'm just asking you to riff a little bit more on that and maybe to flesh out why that's such a powerful right, and beautiful right. kind of thing, right? So. Yeah. So I think I said this, I'm riffing, I'm riffing off of Sophia Cheatham, right? So the, the woman who did the, um, the print. So what she actually says is something towards the, she, she's a, actually it's a great video. And if I had the clip, if I had the link, I would drop it in the chat <laughs> right now. But she did this project. She's a, um, a she's a fine artist. So she did this project on Yara Mahmoud and she called it counter memory, right? So, you know, I mean, you know, and counter memory is a term people use, right? In history, kind of broadly speaking, right? This idea that there's an official memory, there's an official story, right? And then there are these counter memories, these counter stories that we, that we, that we dig up, that we imagine, that we reconstruct because of all of the silences and the, and the, and the ways in which sort of official stories, you know, just, basically obscure, right? The, the, the real dynamism and, um, and, and complexity of history, right? So she uses the term counter memory, this idea of um, it being this kind of counter memory like uh, of, of um, for enslaved African Muslims, which made me think of this because I was thinking about, you know, knowledge of God and knowledge of self, right? Knowledge of self is a concept that kind of, you know, comes into, um, kind of a black Muslim conscious parlance through the nation of Islam um, in Message to the Black Man. Um, Elijah Muhammad talks about this idea of knowledge of self. Um, in hip hop, you know, I work in hip hop, like knowledge of self is the fifth element, right? And knowledge of self is this idea that you have to know who God is, you have to know who you are, you have to know your past, you have to know your present in order to do something in the future, right? knowledge of self, you know, as an aside, and I know since kind of the work you do, I mentioned this as an aside, and I hope someone somewhere will actually pick this up and look more deeply into it, <laughs> but when I was looking up, when I was reading about knowledge of self, um, I happened to just come across um, this book by um, this 12th century Islamic scholar, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, called The Alchemy of Happiness, and the first chapter is knowledge of self, right, and the idea that you can't know God if you don't know who you are is, is sort of the idea. So I'm thinking about knowledge of self and knowledge of God. And then when I listen to Sophia talk about this counter memory and talk about vicar as a form of counter memory, I'm thinking to myself, right, of course, right? You have to remind yourself, right, who you are, right? So it's not just um, that it's not, not, not that it's not just, but remembering God is not, you know, in many ways, I think people can think of religion and spirituality as this thing that you do, you know, the opiate of the masses, this kind of thing. You know, it's about, it's external to who you are. But what she was trying to say and what made me think about was, no, when they're doing this, right, when Yaro Mahmoud was his name, when he's walking through the streets of CC, right, 
And I don't, we don't know what he said. I'm assuming he said, Alhamdulillah, she's assuming, <laughs> we don't know. What he said. But, you know, we, we, we're doing that. We're like, he's reminding himself. It's been 60 years since I've been home, right? Right? But I know, right, who I am. And this is what keeps me, you know, connected to that, you know? Or Omar Ibn Said, you know? It's been 37 years since I was a slave, right? But the last thing I write is about victory. <laughs> because, yeah, the victory is coming. Yeah, so I mean, there's some things so I know. So, so yes, to me, it was pretty powerful when I was listening to what she said. I was like, wow, that's really deep in terms of thinking about that. So I think that's where it comes to for me. And I think there's something, I think also particularly um, significant about that because, you know, like I said, when I started the talk, I do think there's this kind of why did this happen to us? Why didn't people do more? Like, you know, how could, you know, if I was, you know, people say, you know, you know, like, it's like these really horrible uh, memes people have, like, I'm not my ancestors. It's like, dude, do you know who your ancestors were? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, that, but again, but that's because people don't know, right? They don't know. And they don't, and they haven't been able, even taught also to appreciate the broad ranges of ways, right? that people who are people are dealing with and rejecting their subjugation. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, so I stuff. Well, thanks for that, that was great. So we don't have additional questions yet, but um, I, I have a, a question, I think. So you've talked a little bit about uh, the Nation of Islam and I think you know, I think of, of Malcolm X's sort of trajectory and early involvement with the nation and then the pilgrimage and then sort of a, a um, evolved view in the conflicts with the nation of Islam. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit to that and also to maybe some of the um, misconceptions, common misconceptions about the nation of Islam, because it, it seems to me there are plenty. Um, right. Um, I... I mean, maybe you can tell me what you think a common misconception is and I can respond to that. Because um, I'm not, yeah, I don't know. I'd rather, well, if you can speak more to the, sort yeah. of the Malcolm X yeah. piece. That would I, mean, be I, think, I mean, I think about Malcolm and the nation, you know, I mean, I think the reality is there was a split, right? There was a disagreement. Um, you know, I think, actually, I was listening, you know, as I was preparing for this, you know, you think about, because you know, Malcolm X is just an amazing speaker, right? And no, we're not going to be him, but you can learn a little bit from him, right? And they, and I was listening to this one lecture he gave towards the end of his life, and he even mentions, he's like, you know, oh, actually, it was a lecture he gave um, after his house was firebombed. And he was sort of apologizing to the crowd because he wasn't in a suit, right? Because of, I think he was, he, I think he got to Detroit. And he was like, I wasn't in a suit, I'm apologizing. And he was like, you know, something, although I'm not a part of the Muslim movement, that's what he called them, like something I retained from them that was really good, right, was this idea of wearing a suit. Like this was something that was, that was from that, that, that tradition that I, you know, that I felt was valuable. And I think if we look on Malcolm X's sort of life and his trajectory, you know, it's undeniable, right, the, the impact that both the nation of Islam had on him and that he had on the nation. And it's also undeniable that there was a split and there was a disagreement. I think the thing that I like to think about or to hold on to is that, you know, even as Malcolm leaves the Nation of Islam um, and kind of joins what people would have called like Orthodox Islam, his commitment to Black liberation does not waver. Like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change. Well, he, he, he starts the Muslim Mosque Incorporated and he starts the organization Afro-American Unity, right? He's going to the continent. He's trying to build relationships. Even with the nation and people sort of, you know, you know, maybe talking bad about Malcolm, right? After the split, their commitment to black liberation doesn't waver or falter, right? They're still very much on this thing of empowering black people at, on the individual level and the community level. So, I mean, I think, you know, the history is the history. You know, there was, a, there was a relationship that was separated. We're now what? How many decades later? And, you know, there's been um, uh, efforts to mend, right? 
in internally in the community. And I think the thing that they both had and held on to, and that terms of this commitment to black liberation, I think it's probably the most important thing that we should all hold on to in terms of thinking about the relationship between Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. Thank you. We got a question from uh, one of our exceptional students who happens to work in the Intercultural Center, uh, Jaslyn asks, um, I appreciate the conversation surrounding prison abolition, and I had not considered the exploration of spirituality in prisons. In a more general sense, I think there's power in connecting spirituality to a quest for knowledge and liberation. But in a country that seems to undermine education, specifically in certain communities, do you think that the obscuring of the history of prisons and spirituality is intentional? Do you feel that if the history of incarceration was more known, we would have more success in abolishing prisons or at least changing the structure of prisons and their purpose? Okay, thank you. Now, that question is making me think about how I ended and I think I didn't end my talk and I'm like, did I make the point about abolition the way I wanted to? But um, uh, this is a great question. Um, you know, I think, so I brought up prisons because it made sense to me, right? We're starting in plantations, we're ending in plantations, kind of like a loop, right? You know, this type of thing. Um, and we don't, we didn't reform slavery. It wasn't like, okay, let's, you know, I mean, cause like things like sharecropping were you know, these other, like, you know, um, um, what they call it, N not just sharecropping, but the, the convict leasing, all these different things that happen, right? We all know there's just other forms of slavery. Like the, you don't reform slavery, you abolish slavery. It's a wrap. And that's the same thing with prisons, right? Like you can't reform a prison. The prisons have to be abolished. And I think the, the thing about spirituality, you know, I think is that, you know, so two things. So one, um, look at the question, right? Is that people who are abolitionists, right? Particularly those who've been um, directly affected, people who have been incarcerated, right? They see or they frame the quest, right? For ab abolition through their spirituality. This is what Sophia Bukhari is doing, right? She's like, God says that as a Muslim, I must wage a fight against tyranny and oppression. Prisons are oppressive. I actually just went a couple of weeks ago to a rally outside of a woman's prison in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And I think one of the, one of the statistics they pointed out was that I think 60% of the COVID cases in the entire Michigan Department of Corrections facilities are at this one prison. The kinds of sexual assault and abuse Right. I mean, the conditions that human beings are being forced to live in because they committed a crime. Like, yeah, like this is ridiculous, right? And so this is tyranny and oppression, right? And so if you are someone who believes that your job is to, right, challenge and try to fight back against tyranny and oppression, then naturally I think your spiritual tradition will lead you towards abolition. I think that not just the history of incarceration. Well, I, mean, I think, yes, yeah, some of the history, like, you know, one of the things in, you know, Angela Davis's book, it's really small, people can read it, Our Prisons Absolutely is a great kind of primer because, you know, prisons, like, you know, right now the United States has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated population, right? And it wasn't always that way. The prison industrial complex and mass incarceration is something that really begins in the 1970s, right? So we didn't have massive amounts of people, millions of people in prisons in that way. So one, I think, yes, knowing that history would be helpful because, you know, oftentimes, you know, when we inherit something, we think it's always been this way. Oh, this, you know, just like college should be free, you know, because college used to be free. Yeah, you know I mean, like it didn't always be this way. So I think like, yes, I think knowing some of that history would help. But also, but beyond that, it, people talk about um, carcerality is the term they use, like incarceration, carcel, like carcerality. So in addition to the history, it's just like, it's having us rethink why do we think this is the solution to whatever the problem is? Like what leads us to say, you know, somebody, I think something happened recently in the news, somebody was like, they stole toothpaste. And it was like, you're going to jail. It's like, if someone has to steal toothpaste, <laughs> like something might be going on here, <laughs> you know what I mean, right? So why is it that we think punishment and being punitive 
is the most effect is both the most ethical and most effective response to what might be a problem of sorts. So the history is important, but also I think um, just thinking about um, like our assumptions. And I mentioned Miriam Kaba briefly. I didn't want to um, go over time, but you know she does a lot of work and she has lots of books. You can follow her on Twitter. It's like at Prison Culture, and there's a lot of books and things you can read about sort of abolition more broadly. But yeah, I think it is about the history, but also getting us just like thinking, just like the way we're trying to get people to recognize white supremacy when they see it, like because of how it just really shapes and what we think is logical or we think makes sense. It's the same thing with sort of prison, right? We think it makes sense because that's the that's what people say. But when you really think about it, you know, there are other choices and other ways to do it. That answered the question. Thank you. So we have two more questions and I think we have it'll be a nice way to sort of round it out as we approach the end. So the first one is from Professor Dasa, who says, um, we could see in some of the slides, you showed us some Quranic writings. Can you talk about the role you think the Quran played in the struggle, resistance, and survival of the many figures you mentioned in your lecture? Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, there are traditions in Muslim communities um, where the Quran itself is almost like a talisman, right? It's kind of something that you use to protect yourself. This is true whether you just recite it so that there'll be things, traditions of the Prophet Muhammad that says like, you know, before you go to bed at night, say this. When you enter the house, say this. Like all these things are meant to protect you from the evil that surrounds you that could potentially harm you. In West Africa, for example, people will like, you know, write, Quran on pieces of paper and they're pulled up and they have these like leather pouches they'll wear, right, as forms of protection. And so I, so whenever we see an invocation of the Quran, whether it's like in the name of Bismillah rahman rahim like with Omar Saeed, right, this is one verse from the Quran, this is a form of protection, right? People are trying to protect themselves from harm. They're also asking for help, right? They're asking for divine intervention. They're asking for relief, right? Um, and I think they're, and they're also, I think, um, you know, kind of trying to get on their square and like remind themselves, okay, here's what's going on and how am I going to respond to this? Like, what is my obligation? What is my duties here? So I think in terms of, you know, which is basically what the Quran, I think, means <laughs> to people today, you know, um, but I think, you know, it was, for us, it's particularly notable because of how difficult it would have been to get paper and pen, yeah, like like what you have to do, and then to remember, right? To keep in your memory something you learned at twelve that you're going to remember when you're seventy. You know what I mean? Like that is also, I think, particularly profound, and I think that's why it sort of sticks out to us as well. Thank you. So the the last question from Maksud Aftab. Looking into the future, how do you see the African-American experience evolving? Do you see a progressive increase in the socioeconomic influence of the Black community? What do you feel are the main challenges facing the community? So I think a, a future-oriented question is a nice way to kind of... It is out. two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you can go over a little bit, I think. We'll no, 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 no. I mean, I'll say, I'll figure this out. I mean, I think, I mean, that's a really challenging um, question because... Um, to be honest, in terms of the socioeconomic, okay, how, how real do I want to be right now? So I think, I think um, it's a challenging question to ask because I think we see things that are happening, you know, so we just had like, you know, like the NFL and there's this like halftime show, right? With, you know, all these black people and hip hop and this this whole like, you know, um, ode to Compton in a in a in a um, stadium that is displacing black people from <laughs> so, kind of like, you know, like, so and I mean and that is the kind of general I think um, uh, dilemma that we have in this kind of post civil rights post black power world right where on one hand there are these there, there are these instances where it seems like at least some black people are getting something, but then the vast majority of us are not, right? You know, you know, for every, you know, Jay-Z, you know, how many, you know, it's like, you know, that this is not, 
that's just not what it is. And so I think that what that means for the future, um, and I think what that means is that, so I feel like the, the primary struggle, one of the primary struggles is, you know, enabling ourselves, being able to sort of, being able to hold those two things at the same time and then recognize what's really at stake. I think that's kind of the struggle. But I think for the future, um, I don't know, you know, I should be, I'm Muslim, right? So I should be, um, I, should, I should have like hope in terms of the future. Um, I think, I, know, I just think that while it can be really discouraging to see, um, I don't know, that disparity, I also feel like there are lots of places in black communities and other communities where people are like, we see this disparity and this is not right. And we don't want black billionaires. We want everybody to have food, clothing and shelter. We want everyone to be free. We want everyone to be able to like, sort of like have clean air and not, you know, and, and not be flooded out of their homes. But you know, like, this is what we want, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think for the future or looking towards the future, I think rallying around being in community with people who are sort of thinking in those kind of ways um, is what will actually get us to a future. So. Well, thank you once again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kabir. Uh, thank you to Professor Burchak, to Q Dockery, and Mai Lee, who um, is behind the scenes running the webinar. Thank you to everyone who came and joined us um, and for your participation and engagement with this program. I hope to see you at some of the other Black History Month events taking place on campus and virtually, which you can find by checking events.umflint.edu. Also, I wanna mention that next month, um, Thursday, March 10, we'll host our second annual Iqbal Symposium on Islamic Thought and Civilization, which will be done as a hybrid event and you can register for that now. So with that, thank you once again. Uh, please stay safe and stay well. And uh, everyone have a good evening. Goodbye.